Welcome to the Regeneration Podcast. Mike Sauter with the renowned uh, gardener, biodynamic style, teacher, sociologist, uh, Michael Martin. Um, what's it all about, Michael? Like, yeah, so what is, What's it all about? <laughs> yeah. All? Oh. I don't know about it's I want to about... talk to you. I want to talk to you about the um the like in embedding some of these previous conversations. So again, welcome to the Regeneration Podcast. I called Michael last night, sent him a text, and said, see you at 8:30 this morning. Um, but I was just thinking this this cool political game against you, a backdrop of uh you know, how at this stage in your life, at this time in history, this time in American history, this time with your occupation, this time with what you've learned from your different forays into education, what you think about health care, what you think about politics and scale. Um, where are we? That would be the first question in the Bible. And like, what's it all about? You know, and and uh, and does this help us get us there in any way? I And I'm telling our listeners and you, I don't have a pre-planned answer to that. <clears throat> well, first you need to define who we are, mm -hmm. right? And uh, we, as in, you know, the kind of subversives <laughs> who are uh, Christian anarchist types, um, we're, well, we're, well, you know what we are? We're, uh, we're what, at uh, what Heidegger called a destitute time. Is that what they mean by inflection point? So when everybody uses that term? No. No. Um, but a destitute time is a kind of a, a a point at which, you know, as as John Donne says, all coherence is gone. Right. 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 And all coherence is gone. I mean, we gone. can't gone. Absolutely gone. And so for Heidegger. At those kinds of points, what you need, you, you need the, the poets mm -hmm. to reach into the abyss. And, and I, th I thought I, I wrote about this yesterday a little bit in my, my sub stack, but I've been thinking about it. But I think it's true. Yeah, I think and we're thinking about the was, same stuff lately. Yeah. I was yeah. writing about uh, Aristophanes play Frogs, which is a hilarious play. He's so good on everything. Think of the it's, clouds for intellectuals. Everything. Yeah. And he's so, you know, it's so slapstick, <laughs> and it's so, yeah, you know, it's, it's like Austin Powers. Now, did he write Lysistrata too? Uh, yeah. He did. So that's mm -hmm. great on war. Best thing ever. You know, the women just withhold sex. Yeah, there you go. Better, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's so simple, and we're going to be saying it when we try. You know, when you try to finally figure out this war question, uh, it's some stupid game of little boys. Uh, it is. You know, when he wrote The Clouds, it was the best send-up of the intellectual class ever written. You know, we'll probably... Mm -hmm. uh, so say more. Yeah. Well, in uh, in Frogs, he has to, he was trying to get to Hades to uh, find a poet to save the city. And he doesn't know which poet to get. Is it okay. Aeschylus or is it Euripides? Interesting that he went to Hades to find him, too. Well, yeah, well, for it's the afterworld, right? Yeah, right, right. Yeah, it, it, they didn't think of it like But an afterworld that wasn't as kind of like adolescent, shiny, and new as some version of the Christian heaven. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Um, but I think we're in, a, that's where we are. Mm -hmm. Plus, we can, you know, and it's really weird. I mean, you know, we've talked about it before, but we can see in the West anyway. And, and I would say I'm going to a bigger we than, than just, you know, us and our yeah. Christian anarchist compadres, but if we go to the to the big we to the West, you know, even going beyond the United States, you could see uh, everything's imploding, right? Yeah, the 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 jig is up, right? Mm -hmm. And now the the thing the weird thing is, and I. Uh, there's still uh, a sizable percentage of the population across the West that buys, you know, the lies, but buys the the performance, right? So many. But there's a there's an increasing increasing amount of people who don't, right? And who see well, it's just a game. I just, in fact, I just watched a clip from some news 
I don't even know what news agency it was, but so yeah, not one of the mainstream. And they were running, uh, they were doing a little story because uh, apparently Kamala Harris and Tim Walls had a, a commercial they ran uh, that was these two Pennsylvania farmers. We, you know, we vote, we voted for Trump last time, but we're going Kamala this time. After what happened on January 6th, you better believe it. You know, that kind of thing. And somebody <laughs> did just a little little search and they found these two these two people are farmers, they're actors. Yeah, yeah, right. You know, it was it was all inauthentic, right? Remember when uh, when Will Farrell did George Bush for Saturday Night Live? Like just standing with a pitchfork and like or a shovel, but not knowing how to hold the shovel. Um yeah, that that's an American trope that goes back, you know, that's tied in with deep. And you know, I want to get into America at some point too in the land. But that way of telling the story, that's a mythological thing they do to us, right? And and it and it's bullshit too, because I mean I know. um but they, they make it fraudulent partners. because <laughs> what the but part of it is, and I'm not saying they do it consciously, but the the uh -huh. worst being the corruption of the best is the fact that when they parody those things with a seriousness, I mean it's so meta, but um that's usually the avenue where we would also find escape. Does that make sense? No, there is. It's, it would be, we need, I was going to talk about sailing, well, you, know, you know, or just, um, but gardening, getting back to, getting back to things, right? So when they have George Bush pretending to be a farmer, or Kamala and uh, Walls, um, it, it almost makes us loathe that thing. But uh, farming and gardening would be, that's a, that's a way out of this madhouse in the matrix. Right. And the thing is, I mean, they, they don't obviously don't give a shit about farmers. No, no. As we talked last time with Guido, right. Yeah. Um, they talk, they talk, they, they care. And this is, uh, I was talking, I was at this conference a couple weeks ago. I told you about with, with Nate Heil. Yeah. And there was a young woman there, grad student, Want to know my what's my problem with Judy Butler? <laughs> <laughs> well, here's my problem with Judy Butler. So listen, ladies and gentlemen. I don't know her too well to be honest with everybody. Um, well, the thing is, I know the caricatures of her, and I know enough of her. Judy Butler, but also parts of Derrida, especially earlier Derrida. My 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 son Aiden and I've been talking a lot about Derrida these days. Yeah. Um, but so much of postmodern so-called philosophy is not about the search for wisdom for Sophia. It's about rhetoric. Agreed. And what they're all they try to do is uh present you uh, one with a a couple, you know, like a like the the requisite arguments to defend this or that position, like, you know, right. gender gender's a social Construct. construct. Yeah. So you 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 are presented in college with a set of arguments to to kind of memorize. It's like a catechism. Mm -hmm. But I want to read you something that kind of blows my mind. I'm curious. Right. Uh, so our our good friend and my godson, Jonathan Geltner. Yeah. Apparently, I haven't talked to him. I I owe him a call, but he posted something on social media the other day from Adrian College, where I was teaching until relatively recently. Okay. You know, it's part time. Yeah, and he they must have called him back, but uh, as a, as an adjunct. But here's he yeah. took a picture of this because he was teaching. You know, he's he's like us about being aware of uh, political rhetoric and the way you know, and brainwashing and things like this. But yeah. here's what he saw on the uh, like in a poster that they have around the the college. And here's what it said. Critical thinking is defined as a set of strategies by which students explicitly employ the principles and standards of thinking and intentionally use these principles and strategies in assessing and improving their quality and depth of their thinking within. Okay, that part's okay. But here's the part. Here's the kicker. It also, within, but it also all sounds like a tautology, but go it's ahead. bullshit, yeah. yeah. Well, within the context of sociology, criminal justice, and human services. <laughs> <laughs> No, I get it. I get it. And, uh, you know, reminding people that like your definition a few episodes back about critical thinking and its connection to the human body and using your hands and figuring things out is excellent. But go back again. There's a lot of, you know, they just kind of like cycled in these tautologies. The critical thinking is critical thinking is critical thinking. Yeah. And um, and then they go into embedding it just to some things. You unpack that embedding and why it's so uh, unnerving. 
Well, because it, it, it's not just unnerving. It's yeah. it, it's, it's, uh, it's comedic. It's comedic. It's a, it's academic junk food, right? Yeah, yeah. It doesn't have there are no calories. There's no nutritional <laughs> intake. Yeah. Uh huh. And it's not. And that's what when I was so when I first taught philosophy, I was using you know kind of doing it the standard thing that because it was kind of last minute. Can you teach philosophy? We need somebody. Right. Um, I was like, this is crap. This is not teaching philosophy. This is teaching about philosophers. Mm-hmm. So, or again, yeah, consciousness it, raising. The next time I switched it, I switched to Pierre Hadot's book, um, "Philosophy as a Way of Life." Yeah, which is what kids really want and need. And that's, you know, that, isn't that another word for that metaphysics? You know, meaning, yeah. meaning. Well, I think meaning, in some yeah. sense, in I some mean, sense, because we need a word. We need a word for that meaning. Just the search for meaning. Well, it's the basic questions, right? right, right. Why are we here? What's the yeah. point of human life? I mean, but nobody thinks anything life. means anything. Yeah, go ahead. We we agree. It's just... and, and it's this, which is becomes a, a a search for wisdom, and 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 actually, who's really good about this is John Verveke, right? Okay, right. You know, um, even Jordan Peterson to a degree, right? yeah, because it it's they're switching it from that kind of re- that that postmodern. Uh, rhetorical uh, exercise that's that poses as philosophy, which it's not. Mm-hmm. Deconstruction is not philosophy. It's yeah. uh, it's a pose. It's a rhetorical pose, just like feminist criticism is a rhetorical pose. Yeah. Um, go keep. You could go down the, the line, and but it's just learning a, a set of arguments to employ at whatever you know, or, or we could another way call it a set of arguments. Or I can just say it's a lens through which you will look at everything agreed right and but but it doesn't help anybody uh, um I, in fact one of the early and then one interjection because i want you to continue is for me and my son aid and i i think he kind uh, of agrees with me on this and he can he can let me know if he doesn't but when people like and i know more of peterson in this field than verveke although gosh it was how how amazing was john verveke on our podcast you know but um it's almost like they left brain the totality of that other way. So remember, just moments ago, you were bringing in the poets. And uh, Jordan Peterson can talk about Dostoevsky, and he, he can paint those funny pictures he paints. But he he has an amazing way of not being the right, letting the right brain just be the right brain. He needs yeah. to colonize it with the left brain. And I think that movement, whatever we want to call it, not the intellectual dark web, you know, but all these Venn diagrams. But mm-hmm. a lot of it feels like that. And for example, you know, fl- hold your thought, but, you know, we got to come into like whether these guys will vote who are following that stuff. Or, I mean, I don't think voting is that important, but go ahead. I want you to continue. Uh, well, I, I agree because, I, you know, at that conference I was at, there were a lot of uh, Verbeke and Peterson people. Yeah. And it was interesting. <laughs> we, well, as a poet, you know, the, and they're great. You're poet, they're great. you pay attention to the way people talk. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. And I, I could tell who the Verveke people were without even asking because <laughs> right, they would right, use, right. they would use <laughs> words over and over again, like in, uh, in substan- uh, instantiate was, is one of their favorite okay. words. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm like, Oh, these are Verveke people. I get it. Um, and, and, and I like both John and Jordan Peterson, but I think like you say, yeah, absolutely. It's, it's, a, it's a very masculine left brain deal. Yeah. They even do it with that, the young. They even do it with the young. You know, they somehow and turn Jung into not, a left brain guy, and it's not intuitive. No, too yeah. much. I mean, not not too much. Um, it's not poetic. Yeah, it's kind of. It's very rational. Yeah, you know, and it's I like what they're doing, but you know, probably why I can't go all the way there because I I have a sociological approach that's very different. Yeah. Um, I know, or just temperaments. I think you know, did we discover so sociology because we, um. You know, we we are smarter than other people, or we felt our way into it. You know, well, no, I think with those guys, I mean, they they are at least they were in Jordan's case, but John is part of the academic establishment, right? Right. You know, he and he's an outlier, and they let him. Okay, that's thing. super important. Mm-hmm. You know, and he's got tenure, so they can't fire him. Um, and he's a he's a solid researcher. I mean, you know, yeah. so they're not gonna they're not gonna they and uh. Peterson just crossed the line <laughs> talking about gender. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. That's one thing they're not going to put up with in, in free And how much that. we both admire him for 
he found his fame naturally in one sense. He just he he took an yeah he uh, he stood for an act of courage for what he thought was right. In that case, I agree with him strongly. And yeah. then he was always the brightest person in the room when they tried to shout him down. Yeah, and I and I, have, I I have immense respect for him just for that. Yeah, me too. Uh, you know, uh, but you know, and what I like, you know. What I, especially with Peterson, well, both of them actually. What I what I respect in, about them is they know that the part of the correction the correction that academia needs is to re return to the imagination. Okay, so how do we? So that is very different. Put that a little bit in the context of this kind of Trump phenomenon, and maybe at scale, and like Rogan listeners, will they vote? You know, I I did hear some things on CNN this week. Uh, and uh, NPR just driving into work. They, um, you know, they both had stories that like Trump and these his surrounding his good people surrounding him. They're going on the podcast. Right. And like these people seem shocked by it because they're they're not dummies in terms of math. Right. I should say they're dummies who can do some math. And uh, so they know there's the, the possible numbers of votes there. And part of me goes to. Uh, those guys, you know, and I'm going to uh, mention Aiden's name again. Um, and I sometimes I say like, I don't say sign them up to vote or that's the most important thing. I can't even find the energy within myself to say that. But I usually do say like, are they going to vote? Like I'll prudentially vote as I've I've told you. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, I think I'm pretty good with my heart being closer to local things than New York State things than federal things. I probably will vote third party. But again, I can take that. I've mentioned in New York State. Kamala will get our electoral college. So the more freedom to do that um, for the presidency. And uh, but um, what do you think about your because you get it, you know, we need the poets. What does that look like? And then set theory or whatever you want to use. How do you balance that with this kind of national election obsession and what we've been talking about for the past couple of weeks? Well, um well, the, the problem with in frogs, for instance, uh, uh, Athens. The reason he wants to find uh, that Dionysus wants to return to Hades and find find the right poet for the for the job is because Athens is in a in an age of or in a period of moral, political, and social decline. Right. Right. Okay. I haven't read frogs. So. And uh, so, he, well, poets can help us. And actually, one of the things I wrote about there, speaking of the current election. Uh, one thing that really impressed me, it's like 25 or 30 years ago, I uh, was watching some documentary on PBS, probably, about the Kennedys. Uh -huh. And they were interviewing a, a young Robert F. Kennedy Jr. before his voice thing happened. <laughs> and they were asking him what we, they had. They asked him, so what, were, what was your father's state of being after the assassination of your uncle? Right. And he said, that is, my father was reading the poets. Okay. And think about that. We, can you think of any political figure right now? Maybe Bobby Kennedy, but I can't think of any other political figure. No, they kind of threw a literary yeah, part aside on Obama. Remember, they kind of cultivated this kind of thing. Yeah, it, was, it, yeah, it kind of overlapped yeah, right? with uh, Oprah or something. Yeah, it was yeah, horseshit. Right. Um, Oprah's Book of the Month Club. Maybe. Candidate, maybe right? it was kind of tied into that stuff. But... uh you know who I'm thinking of too to be brought into this uh, this morning was, um, you know, the poets. But let's use like the shamans too. But um, I was going to ask you two days ago, did you did you duly recite? I didn't, but I did this morning. Bachel Lindsay's uh, ode to Johnny Appleseed on the 26th of September, as you I should do on March 2nd. Yeah. Well, I was thinking about I was thinking about John Michael Greer just <laughs> today. He's going to start writing on politics this month, and I think it'll be interesting. We should have yeah, well, him on he, the show. Yeah, he's got a very Spenglerian. Uh, he does, but he's he's pretty damn right. But again, he thought he hadn't given up on the whole show, but he was taking it visionary. He was taking it poetic. And when I mentioned Johnny Appleseed for our listeners, this John Michael Greer, who we've had on the podcast, he blogs at Eco Sophia. Uh, everything he says is interesting. Yeah, he's got the greatest book on the Trump phenomenon called A Man in Orange, and um, he. He, at one point, and I sent it to Michael, and it might have been your introduction to John Michael Greer, or at least uh, pretty close to it. My but like this sure. guy, you know, with the elections, he, he I thought he could say more about them than any other writer. But also he just thought like, 
twice a year, he was talking about this kind of shaman figure that's been Disney-fied, again, like earlier, that, you know, when they get hold of these people, they water them down. But um, John, uh, Johnny Appleseed, if you really looked at him through a good historical lens, like uh, um, can be done, he's kind of a shamanic figure. He's larger than life. He read as Emanuel Swedenborg. He was prophetic. And his politics were were politics, you know, that would appeal to this coalition that Mike says, you know, he's always been part of. Or we might call it like the 1960s redux at a higher level without the mm -hmm. sexual revolution. Um, and and in other essays, John Michael Greer would talk about these philosophies. And I'm going to go back to like, where are we going? Where are we? What's America's destiny? But he wrote a great essay called, uh, people could find it, uh, um, Sobernos or Tamanus. And Sobernos is that mystical Russian kind of yeah. concept of all in oneness that at least gives people a felt gut visceral thing to work for, like the Trinity. There's a Trinitarian ontology in Sobernos where people shine in all their uniqueness as they have this total oneness um, that's not the oneness of a crowd, but the oneness of community. And Tamanus um, on our land, you know, we need to be thinking about our land. He said, like, you know, so many Native American tribes um, have rituals. And I know he was referring specifically to a Pacific Northwest tribe, maybe the Salish. But they, they would play music and everybody dances in their own way, right? And he thinks that's an American thing, you know, one song. But it's not, you know, hand over heart, Pledge of Allegiance. Yeah. We're all doing our thing. But um. So, you know, a, a shout out to September 26th birthday share with yours truly, Johnny Appleseed. Oh, yeah. Happy birthday, by the way. Oh, yeah. That's only because I love Johnny Appleseed. Yeah. But, um, you know, a riff on some of that stuff, Michael. Again, like Trump, just uh, just hypothetically, it's not to beat up or don't run for Trump or whoever. Well, but do, does he get us anywhere towards that with, you know, Charles Eisenstein is saying, what if Trump now went to a unifying message? You know, that's not inconceivable. He could just he could shift he a musical register. It's but still so well, much is just owning the libs, right? And uh, well, well, uh, well, I think there's that, but I think he, um, again, this goes back to it's you know, rhetoric or, or propaganda. You know, most of what we hear about Trump has been edited in such a way to show him unfavorably, yeah, right? Uh, well, he's up but if you really it, think right. about it, and we, you mentioned the 60s and the hippies back to Bonnie and they were talking about our 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 old midwife mm -hmm. who Linda honey I love you uh she's probably old am I so she's probably mid 70s at least okay and and uh but she was like those old hippies who were counterculture who living off the land you know what I mean yeah. Earth mother type right and she was so good as a midwife so good so so uh intuitive and perceptive and yeah. knowledgeable um but i think really what you're seeing right now and maybe it has been articulated this way but i think that, uh is and, and johnny appleseed's an example of this and i think mm -hmm. there is a a strong element in especially the american folk soul that's like this that it's countercultural, right mm -hmm. um even if you go back to the Boston Tea Party and that period of the Revolutionary War, right? America was countercultural, mm -hmm. you know. And and I think you, and I I hate to use the trope of rugged individualism. Let's use but, liberty, liberty. We loved liberty. That's what Johnny yeah, Appleseed. That's we'll what Greer was talking about. Right? Yeah. Freedom. Let us do us, and a world where we all have free time to pursue our eccentricities. You know. And that's what we were talking about last time with with Guido. Yeah. Is yeah. that, you know. You know, you can you can say you're a distributist or a Christian anarchist all you want, but if you don't live in a, a society that allows you to let your freak fly, freak flag, freak flag fly, yeah. So what? Yeah, you're just gonna be another drone in in the hive, you know. So right, right, right. right. And so, so, but, and that's what I think one of the strengths about the United States as opposed to Europe is it's, it's big enough landmass and population mass that it's, you can't control it like you could in a smaller, like Ireland you're seeing right now, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's a totalitarian state and a half. Um, but that's easier to control. Australia, easier to control. United States, hard to control. Right. Right. And, but I did. So what do they do? What do they do? I had, uh, I was thinking of um, 
the, you know, the way, you know, we have to understand the game is played, but where, you know, so they divide and conquer really good. They pit people against each other really good. Um, you know, when Guido, if they read his book, uh, Phantasmagoria, you know, the CIA, he basically says there was a 9-11 and then we're in Afghanistan. You know, now everybody's talking about how we got out of Afghanistan. But like, why were we ever in there when Osama bin Laden yeah. was somewhere else? You know, but the, uh, you know, he was saying it was too, we were making so much money, the intelligence agencies off the opium trade. But all of a sudden, yeah. fentanyl, then the coda to that is fentanyl is just being flown in. You know, where does it all come from? It's being flown into middle America where these Trump voters are, you know? You know, the game is pretty high level. Yeah, it's very high level. Where do you see signs of hope with this America? Or are we, again, so in a small one, you could basically put him in jail. They would say Orwell, like, you know, Guido would say it's all there in Orwell. Yeah. Orwell, um, I read this in the pages of Chronicles magazine like 15 years ago, but I can't track it down myself. But the author's name was Andre Navrazov. But I guess he, I thought it was at the end of maybe Animal Farm. But he describes, you know, in one of those places where he describes how communism works so well. And it's so genius he predicts that it's going to be 10 times worse when this virus crosses the pond to america why because that same thing is not going to be a boot on the face it's going to be flies trapped in honey right pornography mm -hmm. um uh you know again the opposite of screens and being on podcasts all the time is gardening and dirt in nature you know is this a real rebellion when everybody's just getting more and more you know data by listening to things you know those all those things where are you seeing signs of hope for this America well, that yeah. can't be conquered? Well, I think not, not John Michael Greer. Um, he's really good on pointing out how this shit is unsustainable. He is good with that, you know. And it's and but it's it's this the political charade is is really what's unsustainable now. Mm -hmm. And whether it ends at this election or sometime in the future, I don't know. Yeah, it could to a degree end with this election, mm -hmm. you know, um, you, you know, if you, you, I think you heard that there's this big thing in Washington, D.C. tomorrow with all the like Brett Weinstein and all. The yeah, 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 yeah. I'm Nicholas, by the way, uh, who right. and it's called Save the Republic. And it's you know, as we mentioned before, it's kind of wild that it's mostly lefties mm -hmm. or or former lefties who are throwing their weight behind this coalition with Trump and Bobby Kennedy. Yeah. Not because they love Trump or Bobby Kennedy that much, but because they see that as a way to um, break the, the, the whole of the archons. Right. Agreed. Um, I think that's um, well said. And helpful. And I'm all behind that idea. Mm -hmm. Um, But it is unsustainable. And I even when I, when I wrote transfiguration, gosh, Five, eight, six years ago, that I saw, I knew it was unsustainable then. I didn't know how it was going to end, but I did know, and we were uh, seeing it right now, that the archons themselves, or the technocrats, or whatever you want to call them, they know it's coming to an end too. So they're trying to rig it so when the next cycle comes, they're still the guys on top. But say more about that. That the well, rigging it. Mm -hmm. You see with with the Harris campaign, right? She goes up and talks and she says absolutely nothing. Yeah, so funny. <laughs> it's bizarre. Yeah. You no. Know? And it's it's all image. It's all image. And I read I read it in the Catholic from her Herald. She can't yeah. handle the rhetoric. It, it's rhetoric's coming from yeah. the news. I read in the Catholic places. Herald that there's and I didn't know of this dinner. It's not my world. But um the, there's a, a big political dinner in New York. Oh, the Al Smith dinner. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And she's the first major uh, Democrat who hasn't gone like ever in the history of the dinner. And it's again, the only point is, apart from the debate where we both admit she was well rehearsed, you know, um, kudos to her. Give credit where credit is due. Uh, but again, there was hey, all hey, those wait, disparities wait, 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 we wait, talked before about. You go, before yeah. you go. Yeah. Now, Naomi Wolf has been talking about this. And Tell me. some people are saying, and I don't know if it's true, but I wouldn't doubt it. Uh -huh. That her earrings were actually uh, earbuds. That Could somebody be. like Obama, somebody was like, "Don't say that. Say this." Yeah. Right? Yeah. Could be. 
and I wouldn't. And she wears the same earrings every time she she has an interview. <laughs> yeah, and saying, and I'm not saying like she schooled Trump or anything. I'm saying she didn't totally go Tharn, which is our Sauter family name. Thanks, Uncle Chris Cook. We always needed a name for that look called deer in the headlights. Mm -hmm. And he just, he coined a term. That's how language, he, it's called Tharn, ladies and gentlemen. Invented okay. once and forever and uh, Tharn. So uh, she goes all Tharn, right? You know, she doesn't know what to say. Or she starts talking about the moon and colors or something. So I grew up in the middle class. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. What the, so, so what? <laughs> but, the, but the L. Smith dinner just proves that they will not, not, not let her have an unscripted moment. And yeah. I can't believe people like that whole Biden campaign. It was just the whole thing has been so, 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 so weird. And this number of people, Michael, I've been around a lot this week who, um, who don't see through any of this, you know, so we were, we, I was talking about this with my family um, in the context of, I think we were just traveling uh, to or from calling hours for a funeral or something, but the idea of this great awakening through these podcasts or Tharn, you know, and uh, it was uh, two, two kids, you know, one was, Aiden was really motivated by the idea that this symbolizes a breakthrough. Then I talked to my daughter, uh, Lucy, and she was yeah, like, it's Tharn, Tharn all the way around, and yeah. Tharn everywhere, Tharn everywhere, Tharn everywhere. And she didn't use that exact word, but our listeners now know what I'm talking about. You know, well, Tharn I is think... just when you've been totally propagandized. Yeah. And nothing's going to break you out of it. Nothing's going to break well, you Well, some out. people are like that, you know, and I think there's something to it, that that idea, I think we talked about last week, that um, propaganda works like a charm on a third of the people, on a, another third... It doesn't work, but they're going to go along to get along. And then there's a third who's like, screw you. And help right? me out. How do they break down those thirds again? I you don't know. know. I, I can't remember who that came from. I think it Probably was need. I bet, you know, so I would say that, you know, the biggest distinction in our time is between a community and a crowd. You know, those people who need more crowd formations, they would be the 30% that's totally susceptible to it. You know, Jesus, again, Jesus came for no other reason to like to decoagulate that and to set people free. That's the gospel, folks. And the fact that the gospel is sometimes used to coagulate people huh. is the worst, you know, which is the corruption of the best. There's a heuristic. Anyhow, yeah, what what draws people to crowds? The difficulty making friends, right? Um, strong parenting, you know, which includes really strong early mothering. And then strong fathering during adolescence, where you you help them become themselves, right? You don't mm -hmm. micromanage. You know where to cut the cord. Um, you gotta you gotta do the right thing as parents. You can't always put your career first, you know. And um, it's because you need we need to create children of God, you know, and to and to give them those first steps into individuality. And then we need to see them take risks and make mistakes. And we need to get rid of our own ego because God made them to be different than us. My favorite line from John Sullivan, who I love so much, is, uh, um, and I, I think I've mentioned it here, but I use it in baptism class. There's only one thing worse than a, a divided family. And the paradox is a united family, right? Because the united mm -hmm. family can smother the worst being the corruption of the best. Right. A divided family with all of its tragedy again. You know, and it's just a paradox to wake people up that you can have a really united family. And it can be very, very Catholic. And you could be strangling your child in the grave by right. downloading too much propaganda into his brain. And it is mm -hmm. a form of Catholicism out there. And we don't get that too close to it by calling it liberal or conservative. Because there's a political liberal Catholicism that's as equally as brainwashing. Um, you, yeah. know, you unpack that. You know, I, I don't think I said that so well. Well, to go back to what we're, we're saying <laughs> about... Uh... Trump and th this whole coalition, and I think this is important, is uh, it's countercultural. That's what they is it Trump. though. Maybe that's I see. I'm not so sure. That's the idea. Like, so I just wrote down embarrassment, Michael, and you know, and that's where. Well, no, but, no, let me go, let me ahead, go yeah. back. Let me finish. Okay. So Trump is countercultural, not like our hippie midwife was countercultural. Right. He's countercultural to the way pe people run things. In, in Washington, right? Fair. Okay. The good distinction. And and I'm calming down a little bit. You don't know. I'm calming down a little have, bit. I mean, yeah. To be countercultural does not mean to be uniform in your counterculturalness. Agreed. Right. Uh, which. But we would but say, like, what's, like what's, that, what's the biggest danger? What's the biggest uniformity that might account for 95% of evil, like in the realm of uh, power and wealth? But we can unpack that later. Continue. Yeah. Um, you know, 
but I think that what what what's a, attracting people to that is it allows them to be countercultural in their own way, right? Huh. And that we saw the dangers of um, the strong arm of of the deep state or whatever you want to call it, the invisible government, as yeah. Edward Bernays calls it. The strong arm of that we saw through COVID and the limiting, the actually the violation of the First Amendment and limiting free speech or coercing other uh, entities like social media platforms to curtail the free speech of Americans, right? And which and other thing, you know, there's so many things that happened over the last four years that were complete violations of the, the Constitution, even. Right. With Trump and his his trials, and or even with the trial of uh, what's his name, Alex Jones, where they give him so these, these fines that are outrageous, which which is a violation of the Constitution. Yeah, and nobody talks about that. Yeah, right. Um. So, and those are all, you know, countercultural figures in a way. Alex Jones, Donald Trump. Now they're a countercultural, you could say, of the right. Where at, but the weird thing is the countercultural used to be in, in back in the sixties and seventies was of the left, or you would think you would say it at the time of the left, but it's not. Um, but it really comes down to, um, you know, yeah, I think this, I disagree. I mean, it, to me, it seems yeah. like it's a it's a the the Aragon here, the mega Aragon, the great struggle, is between, yeah. uh the technocratic state and Johnny Appleseed, right? Between yeah. and, and we're on the side of Johnny Appleseed. Totally. But Johnny totally. Appleseed was able to to operate freely because he he lived in a country that let him. Okay, so let's say technocratic state is at noon, Johnny Appleseed is down down at 6 6 o'clock. Is Trump close to 6 o'clock or is he about like 11:30? You know what I'm saying? In, in so um, far as punny, power and money are a vortex, when I was mentioning the word embarrassment, it's like it's like Aiden will say that his and it's a pretty profound argument. There's exceptions, a lot of places, but he thinks his generation, Gen Z, might be solving the bullying problem. And I doubt it for various reasons, but there's partial truth to what he says. And I think bullying is a phenomenon of daycare a lot. Right. You know, right. some kids left separated from early strong mothering or mad as hell and they're going to be the bulliers and some who are broken from. And there's um, I want to quote. The scholar of that is, uh, uh, it's not Bowlby, the, uh, Belsky, Harold Belsky, uh, B-E-L-S-K-I at Harvard University. You know, and, and the flip side would be the kid who is submissive because he was dropped off too early. So he allows himself to be beaten up. Anyhow, Aiden wants to say, cool, that doesn't preclude the idea that we can be remediating this a little bit. So let's say that part of Gen Z, because they've accepted weirdness more, they're around more of it. And uh, maybe they're, Maybe they're uh, kind of uh, helping us kind of get out of this prepotence, you know, at those young ages. But isn't Trump, in one sense, if that's one of the besetting sin of the age, you know, prepotence, just uh, putting a boot on somebody's head because it's kind of fun. And Silvio Gassel, the grandfather, the father, the, right. the central figure, you know, he just every financial and transaction where you go to the market and you know something's worth 10 bucks, but you, you get it for two. He called that embarrassment. You embarrass right. the other person. Doesn't Trump, in the terms of prepotence and embarrassment and bullying, doesn't that place him? He's kind of a poster child. That's why I'm saying Charles Eisenstein could say, even at this like 11th hour, the witching hour, he could go towards a unifying message of goodness and humanity. But the, the basic, the medium is the message. And the medium is embarrassment, prepotence, and uh, and bullying, I think. Um. Well, he's uh, that's part of his... He's... He doesn't play it the is. game like he's supposed it to play is. the game, right? Yeah. And let me say yeah. clear between him and Kamala, I want him, folks. I mean, yeah. I mean, I'd rather listen to him for an hour <laughs> and a half than, than yeah. Kamala Harris. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I also think part of what we see – now, if you see interviews with people who know Trump, yeah. it's almost universally they talk about how kind he is, how funny he is, yeah. how considerate he is. Yeah. Um, Though he does have this bombastic – uh, rhetoric he can get into. I mean, yeah. like in that famous thing with Hillary Clinton. Well, you'd be in jail. Well, he yeah. didn't put her in jail, right? Yeah, yeah. You know, he did. He thought it would be a, a wrong thing to do. Um, 
No, but I'm I'm agreeing with thing, all of that. Uh, and the uh, guy's uh, against war, basically against war. But I, yeah. 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 Yeah, but a lot of the, our conception of Donald Trump has been framed by a media that wants to destroy him. And so I know, they he hasn't told you the to whole story, more. right? Yep. Yeah. So you don't get a full picture; you only get a partial picture, and that's a successful uh, uh, rhetorical or propaganda tack to take. Right. Well, remember the other story? Well, only it's the, it's the two minute hate, thing. right? It's the two it minute is. hate. But he wasn't strong enough to defeat the people around him. You know, that's the basic storyline. He gets in there. He's something of a Connecticut Yankee. And right. he immediately he's surrounded by Rex Tillerson, Elliot Abrams, uh, just like, uh, yeah. you know, and even tier two, he gets them out. And who comes in? Like John Bolton. That's like going from, mm -hmm. you know, I from better to worse. Uh, oh, yeah, absolutely. And I agree. And they, you know, yeah. is this thing unstoppable? You know, and do we need to start planting gardens again? Well, that's the thing. And, and uh, kill it from know, the I inside. Yeah. And I think, you know, so I have, hence, as we, as you know, I've had some real problems with Donald Trump in the past. Pompeo, uh, Pompeo, and all oh those. Oh my actions, God! Right? Yeah. Um, now I don't want to excuse it at all, but I think what's what's encouraging when I see what he's doing now is uh, I just saw an interview with Bobby Kennedy yesterday, who said they're already putting together a transition team assuming he will win okay yeah so they can and the thing is if you he, you know it's trump you know did no did no washington yeah right he's a businessman from new york um didn't know washington i mean, I think his instincts were right about what needed to go but of course his, his instincts were horrible about who he hired um be, but he didn't, you know, he didn't, I think he didn't have the people around him. And I don't want to excuse that. He's, yeah. he's, he's supposed to know, right? Mm -hmm. Part of the job. Um, but like you said, he didn't start any wars. And that, that pissed, the, that pissed the, the right people off. He still could just be like a burning cinder falling into an ocean well, and the of other, darkness. And the other thing is, I mean, if he hadn't, and he's a weird figure. And I mean, because uh, had he not been so wealthy. These court cases would have destroyed him. Agreed. You know, and they've tried, and this is one of the things. You no, know, that, that mythological archetypal aspect of Trump is something that has no greater follower or almost a interested person in yours truly. Uh, That's where the man in orange, John Michael Greer, is unparalleled. He's a he's an uh, archetype of the American land. That's why I yes. kind of enjoy the show. Yeah. Yeah, and he, there's, I mean. Uh, well, anyway, where, where was I going? Uh, but but I think uh, so so all that that kind of lawfare stuff, which is yeah, that was yeah. designed to bankrupt him, but they couldn't do it. But on the other hand, that's what forced Bobby Kennedy out, because it was the the lawfare against him keeping yeah. him off ticket off ballots and stuff was onerous and it cost him tens of millions of dollars. How about the image of King Kong versus Godzilla? You know, that I really, really want King Kong. And as a kid, I even wanted King Kong better, worse, because uh, yeah, they, I was American. They, you got a bad but, uh, rap in that. But, you know, either right which now. way, I'm in favor of King Kong. But at the end of the day, the cities are just in shambles. And you were still you were still an insect to somebody else's great power games. Right. What say um, you to that way of looking at it? Well, I think fascinating to watch. If I'm in New York City and Kong and and uh, and Godzilla are fighting, I'm watching. I'm pretty interested. I definitely have a favorite, but still, like when I go home, as Chesterton would say, like the uh, he's got a great line on how the hive destroys the family. You know, piece mm -hmm. by piece, the whole thing's been destroyed. Yeah, are they doing um, anything to preserve the basic units of society, localism, and things like that? No, and but when so that speaking of localism, I mean that's um and this what what's what I really like about this coalition is I don't know if you've seen Nicole Shanahan, you know, I haven't seen him any of this week, but she put out a couple of videos, like almost like an ad, but not quite an ad, but actually pushing the idea of localism, especially as far as food production goes. Yeah, you had mentioned. I, and it was yeah. it's so good i mean it's so yeah. good yeah uh, and, and and it's basically she's endorsing what bonnie and i do here in the farm right um 
And I know, in fact, uh, even though I got a cold when I came back from Washington, you we still rarely, have it a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's, yes, yeah, it's, it's taken a while, yeah. but <clears throat> we rarely get sick. I mean, mm-hmm. really sick, cold, yeah. big deal. Um, and somebody asked, well, what, what do you think that is? I said, clean food, clean yeah. water, raw milk. That's, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's yeah, why yeah. When we, yeah, when yeah, we yeah, moved no to all that stuff yeah. over the years. That changed the health dynamic of my family. Uh-huh. Eat real food is the best health and- advice you yeah. can give anybody. Eat real food. Yes. I have a decent amount of junk yeah, food, I mean, but I, and it's not like I allow myself. I enjoy ice cream. And uh, we had this Wegmans, you know, it's our big grocery chain. Wegmans chocolate cake was my birthday mm-hmm. cake. The thing is so freaking rich, Michael. Um, and I, but, um, you know, in the morning, I think I had apple cider vinegar with honey from our garden, uh, kale, beans, uh, Swiss chard. And I did just juice it with three raw eggs from my chicken that are all just pecking around nice. the garden now, just not eating. Yeah. And I just put it back. I tend to do that every morning. Not because I'm a fitness guru. I just, you know, what are you going to do with the vegetables this year? I don't feel like fixing kale or making kale chips right now. So I just like juice it up. Yeah. And, but, but that, but the th- thing is yeah. we have not had uh, in the United States and we saw this. I don't know if you saw that, that hearing that was this week about, uh, about food and about the big food. Yeah, I heard somebody was telling me some of the uh, share it again for the listeners. Well, what well, it was, it, I didn't see the whole thing. It's four hours long, but they had Casey and Callie Means yeah. and all these other people on there, which is really good. But they were talking about just you know talk about big food and the additives they put in Fruit Loops, say in the United States, versus what they put in the food the the Fruit Loops in Canada. Yeah, and they actually showed the they took took the bag out of the box and the the Canadian version of Fruit Loops is has uses beet dye and carrot coloring. Yeah, and, it, v- quick story about that. Father Peter Matola, radical, works at the diocese. Um, he and I are going to have lunch with Bill Kaufman this week, and Father Matola, I'll have him on sometime. He's kind of a uh, he's doing some interesting things city wise, but he was. Uh, Mentioning RFK Jr. And I'm wailing uh, in my department. Somebody left out these cookies, Oreo cookies, and they changed the dip color for Halloween to like bright orange. And he was saying the same thing. Yet I was wailing on these Oreo cookies as he was saying RFK Jr. gave like a 12 minute meander on the evils of this uh, artificial orange color number five or something. Yeah. Well, the thing is, that shit. Is, It'll kill is, you. Uh, it was like nuclear. It's against it's the nuclear. law. Yeah. It's against the law to put that in in products. Yeah. Every place else in the world, except the United States. Yeah, it's so weird. So and weird. it contributes. And, and, and went I right think, to my belly, ladies and gentlemen. Well, but the in the United States, for instance, the obesity rate is forty percent. Yeah. Yeah. But the overweight rate is seventy five percent. That was very powerful in Kennedy's. You know when he. Uh, endorse Trump, you know that. And is this getting out? So you might be more clued in. When they're advertising, are they advertising in a way that there's this kind of like team of rivals thing? And we see Shanahan, and we see Kennedy, and we Vance and Trump. And are they talking about food? Or again, I'm in the political game now too because of this ERA amendment in New York, and the robustness of the truth for me is more watered down to try and convincing 1.5 million people who would uh, temperamentally vote for this thing because they won't read it. And it's not a hard sell if you read it because they're taking away, proposes to take away all age restrictions, you know, adding to, uh, you can't discriminate based on gender and things like that, saying you can't discriminate based on age and it's distinctly evil. You know, so the upshot is like, um, you know, request parents, uh, kids would not have to request of their parents or be notified to uh, have surgery on their uh, reproductive organs and things. Well, I think that's part of that coalition is that, and that's why um, Trump is the, not advertising for the robustness. He's still just targeting ads to try right. to win the race. Yeah. So there's the Make America Great Again sure. coalition. And those people get caricaturized so often. But when you when you hear people who you know who like used to be liberals or were liberals and go to one of their those rallies, they go, people are all nice. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. five years. And whereas you go to a, a Democrat rally, where he's crabby, it's like an it's like an academic atmosphere. Um, but um, <laughs> that's for sure they're crabby. Yeah, wouldn't oh, they be my are. vibe. Everything, I would call it 
It's the grievance. Potential. It's the grievance coalition. You're probably right. You're probably right. I would say like. Uh, but here's the thing, yeah. right? And so you're talking, about, you're talking about you're talking about all you know diversity and not being prejudiced, self congratulatory or race or whatever. Yeah. The thing is, you know who is the mo the what? Uh, it's religious in my way of thinking. What is? But what level yeah. of society which preaches that stuff more than anybody else? Yeah. Is academia, right? Yeah. But academia, they their hiring practices are racist. They're ageist. They're never going to hire a guy or a white yeah. Christian male who's over fifty. They're never. That's that guy's never going to get hired. No, no, right? Um, and I've seen active, uh, you can call it reverse racism, but it's racist practices. They don't. They're not colorblind. They actively right. say we need to hire a black person or we need to hire this. Um, that's how academia rolls. And it's right. such bullshit, Mike. Yeah. Um, because the, it's they act like they're they're all about an open society. They're not at all. Not even no. close. Not even they're close. The exact opposite of that. No. And I've been I've been on the receiving end. I I haven't been in university one tenth amount of time as you, but you know, I've adjuncted at SUNY Geneseo. And just in campus ministry, I've I was involved with things. I was very welcomed into the campus. But it's I've been on the receiving end. I've been victimized, truthfully, just right. for not for not drinking the Kool Aid. Yeah, yeah, and it's it's and it's crazy, and that's why you know, in what we're seeing right now, I think, is higher education is about to implode. It's imploding. It's in the process. It yeah. should have imploded a while ago, but the COVID money kept kept a lot of those small liberal arts colleges alive for a while. But they're all they, they can't stay. They can't be sustained because there just aren't the demographics to do it because nobody yeah. had. To do it. And yeah. all these places were built during the baby boom or earlier, and they were able to fill. You know, you that you could have enough uh, college ready kids to fill those spaces, but now they don't have it, so they're getting kids who are illiterate to come in. Yeah. So they, they teach them you can play sports for four more years. Yeah. What, it's a Ponzi scheme. Um <laughs> it really is, but that's that's yeah, you're right. You're right. Yeah. Right. Um yeah. I think we we hope that the kind of deep state CIA, whatever you want to call it, you know, behind the scenes thing that's not just in the United States, but across the globe. Is also falling apart, or at least it's it's showing st signs that you know it's like this. Okay, in, but in just reminding our listeners, for what it's worth, and you're not, I don't, I don't disagree with you, but Guido would say on that point he strongly disagrees. The thing is airtight, and they've proven for him, he'd say that that ship of state is fairly airtight, and that's not to say you're wrong and Guido's right. It's to say that no, uh, for listeners, no, I, that's a, he's pretty convincing to me on it, you know, and that's where we disagreed, and I took umbrage with him. That um, and we seem to get our courts tangled there when, you know, he was talking about it's amazing how they can't find good actors for the roles. Um, but, you know, on the other hand, you and well, I he says that he's right. They always find a way to, to to fix it. Right. Yeah. 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 But also, they like, even having that head they all, of they're... your number one but state I... be obviously with dementia. One, you know, you would have to say this is a fairly convincing argument. The fact that, like, we had an acting president who had dementia and we nobody have. was really worried. He is I know. Still in office, Mike. Yeah, 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 right. <laughs> but, like, it's not a threat to anything. You would think it would be. You know, and so we're, that's that's an argument to me that well, says this you, thing is pretty strong and self confident. But that's because, and, and I think this is framing. I and think, this younger I group is not voting. I think that is the perception we're sold through the media. Okay. Yeah. You know what I mean? That's the thing. It's a, it's an illusion that's sold, and of course, it, a lot of people, not everybody, but a lot of people buy it. But I think what's happening is a lot more people are not buying it than we're buying it before. For the, you know, that's uh, where I'm hopeful. It was, it's probably always been. This and then evening. whether that's enough, I just don't know. You know, at least it's the at least, at least post World War II. I think yeah. it's the deep state or whatever you want to call it. The uh, tech. The technocracy has always been this corrupt and evil, mm -hmm. but I think most of us ignored it or didn't know or would couldn't believe it. Now we can believe it. The, the what pro the problem with with the way they played COVID, as I they overplayed their hand. Yeah, and now people see it. They're like, this is now this is bullshit. And guess what? Everything's bullshit. Can you um? 
when you uh another image comes to me like when you're watching a superhero movie like marvel or otherwise but so all of a sudden something closes on you and closes boom, boom, series of doors lock that yes the media like the internet is allowing a range of thought but when you look at like you know they're very serious about the cbdc thing um and they seem to have we're, we're we think we're looking at the beginning of like world war three in the middle east and they don't seem that nervous about it um which makes me think those although we're waking up inside this igloo the doors are pretty thick you know you know they're going to pivot to asia um media isn't necessarily getting freer we 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 looked at some giants like titans elon musk who are we think are pretty strong and we think they're fighting for us and they might be um but all the while i think year by year we have less freedoms to think and be exposed to things than the previous year tell me where you agree or disagree no but i i, I well i think that's what they're trying to do but like, as you mentioned earlier you have these long form podcasts yeah. Uh, not just us, but like the big ones like Joe Rogan and stuff, right? Who uh, are able to air these ideas and they attract an audience mm -hmm. and people agree, right? Yeah. Who not not necessarily agree, but they 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 are exposed to ideas that would they would not get enough tr uh, traction in a soundbite on a on a network news show, right? Okay, which has been one of the things that's that's actually been beneficial to Bobby Kennedy, for instance, is he could okay. people what they were they could paint him as an anti-vax kook or something, right? Conspiracy mm -hmm. theorist, but then you see him in a long form interview and go, and you go like, wow, this guy's got the receipts. Yeah, he's not just talking out of his head. It's he's got names, numbers, data, the whole thing, and he's got it at his fingertips. Um, and that's what uh the archons or the technocrats are trying to shut down okay uh, and they're more successful in shutting it down in, in europe and in brazil you saw recently where they're uh that that, that judge who looks like dr evil mm -hmm. shut down x yeah 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 and, and then he actually tried to shut down starlink or something of other mm -hmm. uh, elon musk's other businesses that had nothing to do with it. Yeah. Right? yeah i mean that's 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 straight up evil right it is, um, and you see what's going on in Ireland, where, where they actually they're trying to 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 uh, pass. They call them hate, you know, hate. They're trying to pass laws against hate speech or mm -hmm. dangerous speech, which means generally speech the government doesn't want you to talk about. Like, yeah, not generally. Always means yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, but they always couch it in these. We're keeping everybody safe. We're really worried, right? And England's doing the same. Or the United Kingdom's doing the same thing. Um. So, but but, and so, but the, anyway, I don't know if it can be even if they shut down Twitter and stuff, or or I mean, it might be the only free speech platform out there. Uh, as as we know, have been having been have been uh, ticketed by yeah. one of the platform sponsors of this show. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. A citation. Well, I have um, an idea too. If if like only for me, and then you reinterpret it, you know, for our listeners or like what you're hearing. So you know, I'm kind of describing something of an igloo shape where the doors are closing, and there's this waking up going on inside the igloo. But then when you look at Joe Rogan and this stuff, I hear people kind of broadcasting an idea about freedom. You know, these podcasters and things, and there could be kind of a waking up. Fine. So I'm thinking of Orpheus. I'm thinking of the movie Hades Town, which is based on Orpheus, and I'm thinking of what you said too about the poet that or think of tucker a lot of that is almost like much ado about nothing for me although it is waking people up in hades town the music was starting to play in hades town it pre previously had been monotonous mm -hmm. and in this way there's a different music playing but in a larger extent it much ado about nothing and both in like orpheus and hades town and i think if you were honest and you are it's not like accusing you of dishonesty <laughs> <laughs> the farthest thing i don't think that's you your stop fucking lying yeah. <laughs> yeah that's michael martin who doesn't speak his mind he lies no but the idea <laughs> the image of the poet you know and we're talking these guys are poetic fine but you know somebody's got to lead us out through the dark through the dirt holy saturday lead us out or something not a Moses, or does any of that resonate for you? Or do we keep on listening to this wonderful music in the prison, you know, and stay in the prison? No, 
Well, okay, what does I it look like for the poets to start finding their place? And where does a poet or a prophet come from? What do they look like? What do you think that whole area of prophecy looks like in our time? Well, for Heidegger, when he was writing, mm -hmm. the, the two poets he wanted to rescue from Hades were Holderlin and uh, Rilke. Good, good choices. Um, I didn't know that. That's genius. I hadn't. Where does yeah. Heidegger say that? Uh, in his book, Poetry, Language, Thought, which is my yeah. favorite book. Yeah. In the essay, What Are Poets For? Yeah. Which is why I love that essay. Probably read it a dozen times. Um, this monk we have to have on the show from Ireland, who I've had the privilege of spending a day with, Mark Patrick Hederman, the best writer on desire in the Western world. But he's brilliant on Heidegger, on Rilke, and things like that. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. But I and I actually uh, in my my Substack yesterday, which was on frogs, that that's the, one of the questions I asked. I said, "Well, who who are the who are the poets you would bring back? Yeah, to save the city, the polis. Yeah, right. Um, and it well, and and this, and I guess I have to, you know, what I what I would say is. Well, we don't have it. We don't. People, nobody reads poetry in our culture, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Yeah, that's one thing. Um, or playwrights, and maybe um, it it's a case of having the space to do it, having the freedom to do it. I mean, that's the the problem with totalitarianism is it tries to occupy every aspect of your life, right? right? Um. And, and that's one of the themes of 1984 is people aren't aren't allowed to just imagine or think or wonder or make music or go outside. They're right. all listening to podcasts Anything about happens. big ideas in the igloo that sounds like freedom, but it's not. It's a Same form thing of happens in a uh, Brave New World, right? Right. Contemplation is the thing that that's uh, abhorrent. Um. So, but you, but you, and I, and I, to, to one place I have encouragement, for instance, is uh, I've had such a positive response to this sociology class I'm offering, you know, which I have almost 30 people enrolled yeah, in. Yeah, that's exciting. It is exciting. And it's if people from uh, like college students all the way to people with PhDs, people from that's every cool. walk of life. Um, and it's nice. I mean, it's really, I was surprised. We had the first one last week. I was surprised at how, uh, not just congenial, but, you know, you see these people, they're interested in sociology because, and I'm trying, and the way I've uh, structured this course is to make it more contemplative than academic. Yeah. Um. And you see this, and I, in fact. Uh, very cool. It's very cool. I see it, like your son, Aiden, and my son, Aiden. We both have sons called Aiden. I think yeah. they're both the same age. How old's your Aiden? 23? Oh, I, uh, oh, people always tease me about that. Yeah, 23, 24, something like that. Yeah, my, <laughs> so my son's 23. He'll be 24 his next birthday. Okay. Um, that uh, What's his birthday? February 7th. Okay, they don't have the same birthday. Um, but, and that's the thing. I mean, you have to, you have to, uh, and maybe even in Rilke's, or not Rilke's time, in uh, Heidegger's time, but also in, uh, Aristophanes' time, mm -hmm. right? That you see the city in a period of decay, which is what we see right now. We see it, right? And, and our city might be the West, but it's also these micro cities as well. Um, but there's always uh, a counter movement, right? The the what Milbank calls the alternative modernity. Mm -hmm. And that's what I see in the sociology course. And actually, when I see, so yesterday, for instance, we'll get this, you've been here, the meadow across the road, I hadn't mm -hmm. walked out there since the spring. Usually when I've been going on hikes, go in a different direction, but I said, yesterday, I'm going to go in those woods back there because I got to get ready for deer season. Mm -hmm. So I walked across there and the grass is over my head. It's that high. Uh -huh. And, uh, I bumped into a guy who was out there. He just was moving his trail cam from one place to another. Was we it your property? 20 minutes, right in the middle of this field. Mm -hmm. Right, we're talking about various stuff. Um, but there is there is a counterculture out there mm -hmm. that's connected, and it's connected to nature, and it's connected, and it, it's, uh, it's, uh, 
it's still vibrant. And I think what, what the interesting thing is with this kind of uh, dismantling of the superstructure that's going on because people are figuring out oh, everything's bullshit. Um, Some you people. See, you see this movement from people from that direction you know, from from a countercultural or back to nature, back to the land or whatever you want to call it, kind of movement, back to Sophia. They're now it gives them the inspiration to push back. Not and not just fight push back, but to to live to live a life of meaning and authenticity. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and and this is what I think Greer's talks about with Johnny Appleseed, right? Yeah. So and and Johnny Appleson, you could say, is an example of the poet who reaches into the abyss. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And one of the things Heidegger says, who is in fact, oh, the book is oh here, I'll read it. It's a great quote, and I want to get it right. I think like Jordan Peterson casts himself as like a shamanic figure. Yeah, uh, it's, it's not, not, yeah. not a yeah. convincing performance, but <laughs> he'd like to be. What, what the idea what, of a true shamanic figure is interesting, right? What does Rudolf Steiner say about the destiny of America? You know, there's well, a, he's got, Stephen he's, Clark is pretty interesting on it in that Mexican mysteries, you know, the underworld, Holy Saturday. Like these are some of the mysteries for a different podcast. The whole yeah. idea of meta, you yeah. know. Yeah. Steiner talks about the folk souls of nations. And I don't know yeah. if it applies to America because America yeah. is yeah. weird because it's so mm -hmm. young. Right. Um, here's Here's what Heidegger says. To be a poet in a destitute time means to attend singing to the Orpheus. traces of fugitive gods. Yeah, okay. It's that singing, right? Which yeah. you with Hades Town, but yeah, also yeah, yeah. that's what Johnny Appleseed did, right? Right, right, right. He was mm -hmm. he was in, in planting apples, by the way. Yeah. Oh, speaking of here's here's a here's a sidebar. <laughs> I know it get so. I made a bat. I started making a batch of sicer this week. Which is uh, sicer? Let me guess. Well, so it's a fermented. It's got a cider and sicer. Don't know exactly. It's it's mead, uh -huh. made with uh, apple cider instead of water. We're extracting so add, today here. Okay, yeah. So it's supposed to be. Yeah. But anyway, so huh. speaking of Johnny yeah. Appleseed, right? Um, yeah, yeah. And that just that image of Johnny Appleseed crossing the the ohio valley and i think he made it into yeah Michigan, yeah 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 you know yeah. and planting apples back um that's yeah. that's the talk about a subversive gesture right there's there, a that, there's a beautiful image of positivity recurring. and hope yeah. right there's a beautiful image that i hadn't discovered because i did read the vachel Lindsay poem that should be read twice a year ladies and gentlemen on september 26th and i think it's may 3rd but um where the central motif is he he shows domesticated hogs or pigs until they move across the Appalachians. And he's setting it up for when Johnny Appleseed goes across the Appalachians. And then they become wild boars again. And the yeah. chickens become like the phoenix. It's yeah. a beautiful image, you know, that I think is part of who we are as Americans, too. The rediscovery of the fantastical, you know, which is Johnny Appleseed. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, and it's, uh, I mean, that's, that's a vision like Blake. It's full of hope. Yeah. Right, it's full of hope mm -hmm. in a destitute time. Mm -hmm. Right, and that's what yeah. a, that's what Heidegger says the poet needs to do. Right, yeah, yeah. And I think Johnny Appleseed did a per tremendous American example of 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 how that works. <laughs> um, and I'm sure there are other examples too. Maybe people that father Ed Dylan, it. who was on the podcast, who died last year. I'm smiling because whenever he heard me like seriously discussing Johnny Appleseed. Something about it, it set off something in him because he could just picture the Disney movie. And again, the gentleman's name is John Chapman, you know, and he came through. But uh, all of a sudden, I'd be passionately talking about Johnny Appleseed like you are now. And then he he just couldn't take me seriously because for him, it was just like Johnny Appleseed. would be like seriously talking about uh, Mickey Mouse or on an episode of Friends. There was a doctor uh -huh. who took seriously Arthur Fonzarelli. Well, um, you remember. Yeah. yeah. Well, you remember that Grace, right? Which I used to sing with my my Walter yeah, kids. Yeah, so I, I know. It's the yeah. genie, right? Yeah. And so I thank the Lord. It's Johnny Appleseed's yeah, Grace. Yeah, yeah, we talk yeah. about it. And so I thank the Lord who for giving me the, the apple seeds. The things I need, like need the sun and the rain and the, the apple, apple seed. seed. Yep. Right? Yep. Yeah, so, that's it right there. That's yep. sophiology in a nutshell. It is. It is. Yep. Yeah. 
and then a lot of weird Swedenborg stuff on marriage and everything, which is really cool. It is very cool. Yeah, this yeah. was this was a this is a good thing to talk about again. We didn't really know um, where it would go. I think it's work in progress. I might, you know, you have the contact for John Michael Greer. It would be fun to catch him because I have a feeling he's been writing. I, I I I forget about him for like four months at a time. Then I read him three weeks in a row. Yeah. Um, there's certain like every second, you know, Wednesday he does something on a book that I'm just don't happen to be reading, although I probably yeah. should. And, you know, and then I think he's been writing a series on Wagner and I have to read those, but I bet you he's going to say some interesting things about the election. Cause oh, I'm uh, sure he will. Yeah. I mean, he gets he rewarded does, for doing actually, so. Actually, if, if you follow him on X or Twitter, yeah, he's always got something interesting to say about politics there. Right there. Okay. Okay. I'll have to look for it. Um, yeah. Maybe uh, like you have that contact that wasn't yeah. through his wife, right? Oh no, it was to his wife. Wasn't it? You know, and she passed away. You know, like she passed away, but yeah, but I, I bet you have somebody else tending that same email. And or something. he might be doing it now himself too. But yeah, yeah. yeah. Interesting. We, we All right. Him. What are you doing today? What am I doing? Well, I have my my sociology class. It's supposed to rain. I don't know what's going on. Okay. I hope. Yeah, you rains. get a little more. You get a little more of this thing than we do because it uh, trailed kind of westward after it came up the Gulf that hurricane. Well, the hurricane didn't quite make it. We thought it was we were supposed to get rain for four okay. or five days, a little bit. Now they changed the the okay. prediction. Yeah. So I hope we get some because it's been very dry. Yeah. Very dry. Uh, but uh, what are you doing? We're extracting honey. Well, I should say Amy's going to do a hundred percent of it. Basically, I got to uh, get rid of uh, like some yellow jackets in a wall, and I got to uh, oh. Several just fun fall kind of odds and ends. I think yeah. it'll take up about four hours or something. So yeah, I, I have a little. I have a little bit more honey to spin out, which I'll probably mm -hmm. I don't know if I'll do it to probably tomorrow or Monday. I'll do it. I guess. Yeah, that'll be it for honey for this year. How many quarts do you think you're at about? Um, this I mean, this is just not much. It's probably two gallons, three gallons. Okay. Yeah, but I did. I got six gallons earlier in the summer. Okay. Which I, for, with that, I made. How many hives do you have? That, I made that sizer and I made some mead, yeah. huh. which the mead will be ready maybe next week. Looking forward to that. How many hives do you have? Just two. That's cool. Yeah. But We're uh, starting ours, but I think there'll be what we brought in today. It's just one of the two we started. We might let winter with their own honey because um, they're kind of small and we have a long, kind of brutal winter. Um, you know, and then here. really, yep. And uh, yeah, I want to make sure it looks like one of the hives has enough to get through the winter, the other one not quite enough yet. So yeah. that's why I want to get this stuff spun so I can give them the frame so they can clean them up and add more honey to their stores. Yeah, right, right, right. Very cool. Well, this was this was fun as always. Um, that we got to get that architect, he sounds like a great guy, so we'll write yeah. to him and maybe talk to him this Good week. Time. And um, yeah, a lot of other people interested in coming on, we want to have on. We got to get Tara back. Yeah, we do. You know, if Tara listens, holy cow, it's just a space in my mind. You know, she was a new mom and busy for a while. And then all of a sudden, it's like a year later. How old do you think the baby is? I, I bet you it's been like a year oh, and a, a half. Year. Yeah. Year, year and a half. Year and three months, something like that. on ours. All right. But well, yeah, rock and roll, my friend. Got, yeah. She have four or five. She's got a bunch of kids. Yeah. And is she still, she doesn't tweet quite as much as she used to. I'm not on Twitter as much. Or also, I don't think there's as much rhyme or reason as I used to have on Twitter, even with Elon's thing about who shows up. Like I have to always have to look for Glenn Greenwald. What do you do? Can you tag those and say, these are the ones I want to see? I know you can unfollow, but. I think the more you like, if you like them. Yeah. You know, it'll like, okay. I'll start liking. I think more. that'll, that changes the algorithm. So you'll see it more often. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. All right. Okay. Well, everybody, thanks for listening to the regeneration podcast. We'll see you again next week. Very well.